somewhere between 400,000 and maybe more users every day. And since it's an anonymity network, it's actually a little difficult to know how many users we have. But we have some privacy-preserving metric servers where we try to make some statistical guesses, which we think are pretty good in that we're pretty sure that it's close and we believe it is privacy protecting. We do this based on GYP. So the number of users we think is somewhere between 400 and half a million. Sometimes it goes much higher than that. Um, and this is just directly connecting users. And I'll talk about the architecture of the network so we can sort of understand better what that means. So real quick, a uh, recap of anonymity networks, or just in general, what we're trying to defend against. So Tor is a tool which is meant to defend against traffic analysis. Right? So basically, we've got three major things we want to deal with. The first is that someone might be watching Alice. So for example, Alice has a DSL line or an internet connection of some sort. And she's subject to so-called wiretapping or, or lawful intercept, so-called lawful intercept. <clears throat> Another part might be that uh, some researchers are trying to control part of the network in order to do something, or some, some government or some attacker. <coughs> and of course, they might try to impersonate who Alice thinks she's talking to. So you want to layer and compose different crypto systems together so that you can try to defend against this, obviously. And the idea with Tor is that we've built some of the basic building blocks and we hope to be able to combat most of these things, if not all of them, at the same time, but not necessarily um, all of them at the same time across the entire planet. That's sort of a difficult thing. 
So the idea here is that we can't defend against end-to-end -end traffic correlation if the attacker watches the input and the output. That's quite a, quite a difficult thing. So to give you an idea about the state of the network, the red line here is the number of relays. These are computers that are running Tor that are public relays. That is to say they're, they're part of the peer-to-peer -peer network. So in 2009, um, we were just above you know, 20, uh, 1,200 relays or something like this. And these days, we're actually getting up quite a lot um, towards 3,000 relays, which is quite a lot of growth. And this blue line here is a little strange, and it's also kind of misleading, because um, it's only part of the story. So the blue line is bridges. These are exactly like relays, except they're not in the public directory, which means that in order to find them, you have a sort of work quotient that you have to fill. That might be that you have to send an email to someone, it might be that you have to do um, you know, some friend-to-friend -friend thing. You might have to communicate with a system. It's not automated. And this is only the bridge relays that people have decided to tell the Tor project about. It does not tell at all about the number of private bridges that are run by individuals where they only share through social networks. So they're both relays, essentially. Just one is easy to find through the discovery mechanisms that are automated and one that is not. Usually the reason that we have bridges or that people use them is because during censorship events, since the list of relays is public, the IP address and the port number are known to an attacker who may try to filter connections to this IP or port number. So one way to get around that is by making the discovery problem hard, we take an impossible problem, which is how do we keep the Chinese government from learning about all the Tor relays? Which is impossible because you need to know about all the Tor relays to make decisions about routing. To how do we keep some relays which are private away from everybody and only give up small bits to some people, which is at least possible. We can sort of do something about that. But even that actually, as you'll see, is very difficult because the number of people in China that are working on this problem and the number of people that are willing to invest the time uh, is maybe even greater than the methods we've come up with. So we're looking for some good ways to solve those problems. The first one, of course, is difficult because the Tor Network's topology is a, is a, it's a you could say it's a by clique topology, so every node needs to know about every node, and every user needs to know about every node to make anonymized routing decisions. So the bridges really only provide accessibility, but they also have to be able to reach the entire Tor network for routing reasons. So it's quite difficult, and of course if you run a relay you can try to discover bridges, there's all kinds of things for this. So despite that, this doesn't show all of the private bridges that are running, and it is, uh, of course, a, a, you know, it's a statistical um, measurement. So I think actually in, in this case this might be close to accurate, but of course there aren't absolute numbers on the graph, so it's not really helpful. This is the graph that really matters though, which is the amount of bandwidth that we actually advertise in the network. So and that's in megabytes per second. So we're we're close and fast approaching something like three thousand megabytes per second in terms of capacity. And you'll note that the network was pretty slow previously. So if you ever used Tor before November 2010, the network has grown almost, in terms of capacity, three times as large as it was before. Even though if we look here to November 2010, the network is, you know, it's got some spikes here, but the growth is not exactly the same. The number of nodes is not exactly mapped one to one with bandwidth, right? Because if you have 10 nodes on a DSL line and one node on a gigabit connection, they're not going to be the same in terms of capacity. So different data points. And uh, we actually measure actively, since it's an anonymity network, we actually measure what bandwidth we see, not just what bandwidth nodes report. And clients use this in order to make routing decisions. So if someone were to lie and say, hey, I have 10 gigabits, route through me, I've got lots of capacity. Well, that's a really big problem if clients believe that. But if they really have 10 gigabits, it's worth considering them as a routing choice, but we still want to be careful in how we weight the bandwidth in order to change the routing. So, real quick, we're going to go through, <coughs> I'm going to try to go fast through this because we have some really crazy stuff that happened in the last 24 hours, which I want to talk about, which is way more important than what's on these slides. Um, sorry to bore you with these details. But basically, in Thailand in 2006, we saw the very first censorship event of Tor. Now, this doesn't exactly cover corporate censorship events because I don't care about corporate censorship events in the same way I do about national censorship events. So in Thailand, trying to access our website in 2006, it was filtered, and you would not be able to reach it. And they did this through DNS poisoning. 
In 2006, uh, an American company, I said I don't care about corporate censorship, but I care about corporate censorship in the framework of companies that sell equipment to countries. So Smart Filter, which sells their equipment to, say, Tunisia and to Saudi Arabia and to other places, they started filtering for a simple, simple fixed string, slash tor slash. Uh, ironically, I think this probably had a lot of collateral damage. I don't really like that term, but I think it's important to, to know that it happens on the internet too, which is that is not exactly the most unique string. Um, but that's fine. And we'll talk a little bit about how we can exploit devices that have collateral damage. Um, po let's say possibilities. That's a, probably the best way to put it, right? Because in this case, obviously, that, that will cause a lot of trouble. And if you have this simplistic classifier where you just look for a TCP string where someone does a GET request for it, slash tor slash, well, that's not a particularly good way to filter, and it will have a lot of problems. And of course, lots of people did exactly that. So if you see something that claims to filter tor, it is often the case that they filter by this. And that's because these directory fetches, that is to say, the way that we learn about different things on the network those directory fetches were happening over just plain text HTTP. So stateful inspection of that was quite easy. We don't do that anymore. The solution to this particular event, which we should have done in the very first place, but we didn't for a few reasons. Um, this, of course, was easy to thwart. Some companies still think they filter Tor because they do this, and they've never bothered to check, and we're not going to like report to them that their product doesn't work. <laughs> um, which is fine, right? So I mean. An interesting thing there is that lots of companies make bold claims and they don't know what they're talking about. And we're happy to let those people live in a delusional world. So um, part of the reason that we don't disclose these types of things also is that there's an arms race that's happening. And it's a pretty serious arms race. And we want to try to control the pace of the arms race as best as is possible. Because there are little low-hanging fruits about censorship. And we could fix every single one of them. But then the next time someone finds a really difficult to change protocol distinguisher, we would be kind of concerned. It would take a lot of work to fix it. And it might be the case that we can't easily fix it. <coughs> we don't want such a thing to happen. We would prefer there, we don't say, you, if someone is using Tor, it's impossible to detect it. Instead, we say, of course people can detect what you are doing on the internet, and of course they can see that you're using Tor, but they don't know what you're using Tor for, necessarily. And uh, Andrei Chenko aside, I believe that that is true. Um, gosh, I wish he was here. So, so that, um, that said, we could have fixed this long ago, but this gave us a data point. And the data point it gave us was, are these guys targeting us? And the answer is yes. Are they talking, targeting us now? And we believe the answer is still yes. Are they doing a good job now? Well, who knows? Uh, we're not going to tell them. Um, so the same thing happened, of course, in Saudi Arabia in 2007, because guess who sells it to Saudi Arabia? I guess it's on the slides, but if anyone has a guess, it's pretty easy. Um, fascinatingly, during the Iranian uprising, the Green Revolution in 2009, something really hilarious happened, which is their smart filter devices um, basically weren't working correctly. So they kicked smart filter out and bought some new filters, which maybe some, somebody thinks their home rolled. It depends on which layer of filtering you're going through. But as soon as they did that, the old method of getting directory fetches with that slash tor slash started to work again because they thought they had it covered, and now it turns out they don't have it covered anymore, or they didn't. Um, things are a little, bit, a little bit more difficult these days, but the, the point stands, which is that people sort of treat these censorship uh, systems as if they are perfectly interchangeable, but they don't actually collaborate well, and since they're corporations that are you know, hiding their intellectual property, sometimes one of them actually has a protocol distinguisher, but it doesn't do something else well, and so instead of composing them, they throw them away and put new ones in, and then the old ones had interesting things that the new ones don't have, which is great, we don't care. But I mean, it's good to know that it's happening. It also helps to fingerprint which devices are which and of course where they're being used. <coughs> Am I going too fast? Maybe a little bit? You guys probably all speak every language, including English, better than I do. So I just want to check in, so. <laughs> I'm okay? All right, great, awesome. So. We needed to fix the fact that there are, were protocol distinguishers with TLS. Um, there, were, there are a whole bunch of really weird ones. Um, 
But basically, you know, sometimes the serial number wasn't exactly what you would expect, or maybe the time and date on the expiration or creation wasn't what you would expect, or maybe it's not signed by a valid certificate authority because, well, it isn't. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is that um, they looked at what we were doing, and they said, okay, this is a protocol distinguisher, and we're going to block based on that protocol distinguisher. We've had a couple of these, and the main things that we found are that they like to find protocol distinguishers which are very easy for us to patch on the server side. And then we can upgrade the servers, of which if there's only 2,700, that's really easy. And it means everybody's client that broke yesterday is working again now. So when there's a censorship event, we actually have these graphs where the network will drop out. So let me give you an example. In June 2009, there was a lot of crazy stuff happening. Um, specifically, you'll note, there were under 2,000 people in early June using Tor in Iran. And in China, there's something like 8,000 to 16,000 people. Well, there's an uprising, which some of you heard about, I'm sure, and all of a sudden, everybody realized that they actually did care about this totally obscure problem called traffic analysis, only they called it privacy, or they called it censorship, or they called it censorship resistance, or they called it getting over the potato wall which is just a, you know, cul some cultural thing I don't really understand, but it works. Um, and you see that this is, of course, you know, quite a spike, right? To go from about 1,000 users to go to about 10,000 users in a matter of a month. If you want to, you can look at the news events from this time, and you can see that things are heating up politically and socially. And so there's a correlation here between people who start to care about privacy and the government cracking down by exploiting the infrastructure they control to kill people. And when people realized that that was happening, they started to take their privacy seriously. So usually these graphs, even though they don't always make sense as an outsider, the graphs <coughs> usually correlate to something that's happening in the country. And if you know people in the country, there's fascinating information for correlation. And um, I think it was Nadia Henninger a really fantastic um, researcher from Princeton who is now at UC San Diego, she had some students working on a news to tour graph correlator. So you could see when there was some kind of crazy event in the country and she could predict there would be an upswing in tour usage. Something like that. I mean, I, I never saw the results of her work, but she told me about it. And I think that's it's fascinating, right? Because it gives you a really important data point, which is that the things we do with technology really matter for people's lives every day. And in this case, in Iran, there are people that were being killed for, you know, ridiculous stuff, and sometimes just innocent bystanders. And so these uprisings, or these crazy uh, moments of instability, we see an uptake. In Tunisia in 2009, we saw a lot of smart filter. And one of the things that we saw with smart filter was that they would specifically take your DSL line, and you'd get a special personalized filter where only port 80 and port 53 work. Everything else for TCP IP would be filtered. Now, I didn't have access to too many machines in Tunisia at the time, so it was a little difficult to do analysis on this. But my understanding is that they really cracked down quite a lot across the whole country in terms of accessing things. And their block page in their censorship system, it's called Tamal 404, which is basically what they call the censorship page that they would receive or any of the other blocking, uh, any of the other blocking events that they would encounter. I actually went to Tunisia after the revolution um, a couple of months ago and uh, gave some lectures to students. And someone said, but what about anonymity online? What about all the bad people that will be anonymous online? And so it was one of the rare moments where we got to ask the class of people, well, raise your hand if you were blocked by Omar 404. And every person, including the person that asked that question, raised their hand. And I said to her, well, well, how do you feel about it? You and all of your classmates are those bad people. How do you feel about being able to freely read things online? How do you feel about being able to be anonymous? Did that help you? And a lot of people said that, yeah, it did help them. And she reconsidered the fact that maybe what she wanted was to realize that the bad people were the ones in control of the surveillance and censorship systems. So what about that? Quite an interesting thing. So I set up a Tor directory authority. There are eight of them in the world. And I set mine up on port 80. And it turns out that smart filters, filters don't work so well. They're not so smart. And uh, on port 80 of my directory authority, you could bootstrap. And so Tor worked in Tunisia, even during the most harsh of censorship events. Really strange thing about Tunisia is that SmartFilter, as I understand it, is owned by, I believe, McAfee. 
think it's McAfee. I could be wrong. It's hard to keep all these American corporations that censor people, you know, you know which product lines go where and who owns them. But my understanding is that McAfee was later owned, it might have been McAfee or Symantec, but in any case, one of them is owned by Intel. So by a couple of degrees, the censorship system for Tunisia is run by Intel, and they probably don't even know it. Also fascinating is that the people in Tunisia at the Tunisian Internet Agency do not have access to the filters. So the entire national internet for all of the government and all the education systems is run by an American corporation outside of their country. And they do this to beta test their hardware and software on an entire population so that they can ship updates to Saudi Arabia without having hiccups. Thanks, Intel. <laughs> okay, fast forward to China. We finally had our first real countrywide block. I mean, a real, real countrywide block. They just grabbed everything and uh, put it into the filters. We also, um, <clears throat> we have these buckets I mentioned. The way that we structure it is with a hash ring. Um, basically what we say is that people who come from certain areas in the hash ring, they get particular segments or buckets of bridges. And that's how we distribute those IPs. So instead of just having one list you download, if you come from the Tor network, there's a list of bridges you're allowed to learn about. Those bridges, and only those bridges, will be given out to you because that's where you end up in the hash ring. So the Chinese government, or whoever runs their censorship system, went through our bridge buckets as much as was possible, probably with a botnet or something like that, and they hit this page, and they got as many bridges as they could. And they actually depleted about 80% of our bridges. I think it's 10% of which we don't give out at all. Those are what we call reserve bridges. And then 10% which we, which we hand out over social networks. It could actually be um, 40, 20, but I'm not entirely sure about that. <coughs> Anyway, they didn't get them all. So we were pretty sure they didn't break into the server and get it. We're pretty sure they enumerated it by be, being users, basically. So there are two, <coughs> two really important parts here, which is probably obvious to everybody in this room. Far more obvious than it is for people in other rooms. Um, relaying and discovery are two really key problems. right? With bridges, we're trying to make the discovery problem possible for people where the censorship does not interfere with their ability to do the relaying component. Right? Relaying is where you pick from a list of servers you know about how you will build a, a path through the network. And the discovery component, of course, is how you learn about the whole network, but also how you, how you learn about reaching the network. Discovery is a really hard problem to solve when people block access. And that's, bridges are a partial solution. Um, but as we have protocol distinguishers, more and more, this of course becomes um, quite a serious thing that we need to deal with, both of these at the same time. I'm going to talk about Iran later, <coughs> because in the last 48 hours, there's been some crazy stuff that's happening. I mentioned in this slide here that we tried to make Taurus TLS handshake look like Firefox and Apache. All right, so OpenSSL or NSS, lib, sending the right cipher suites and all that stuff, connecting to an Apache server that, that does the right TLS server hello. So it's supposed to look really similar. And the theory is really simple, which is that there's so much collateral damage from blocking SSL that that's not going to happen, right? Because surely if they wanted to block us, they would not take down all of the SSL for the whole internet, right? Well, that's a really interesting gamble, and we'll talk about the results of that in a minute. Um, first, I want to talk about a little bit about the security and diversity. So it is really important that the Relays in the network are diverse in the sense that we don't want every single Tor relay to be in one country, probably. We probably don't want them to be run by one group. Right? The idea here is we want to compartmentalize the diversity and the interests of the people that run the relays. And just the same way, we want to ensure that the diversity of the users is spread across every domain of humanity. And part of this is because if it is only the FBI anonymity network, well, then it's not much of an anonymity network at all, right? So I actually met some FBI agents by bad luck at a networking <laughs> conference, and uh, one of them said, like, oh, God, we don't use Tor. We have our own anonymity network. And I thought, wow, this guy is incredible. No wonder they don't catch more criminals in the United States. They have their own anonymity network. Well, that's funny. Please tell me, could you click on this link? Right, because the only people that are going to click on the link are the people on the FBI anonymity network. And as soon as they click on the link, well, it's not much of an anonymity network anymore, is it? It's just an FBI agent, and the net blocks associated with it are clearly the FBI. <coughs> because the anonymity set is one, just the FBI agents. 
right? So you don't have plausible deniability. You can't even pretend that it's anything other than that. And of course, if you were to automate a system of getting the FBI to click links, well, you would automate a system of discovering all of the exit nodes of their anonymity system. That doesn't mean that you would be able to de-anonymize them and know that it was Agent Dumbass, in the case of the guy I was talking to. But you get the idea, right? You can't have an anonymity network where it's only special people. Because as soon as it's only special people, it turns out that you have sort of changed the anonymity set from possibly anyone in the world to just some small set. And then you have a lot of other social components that really come towards de-anonymizing a user in a real sense, especially if, for example, the system doesn't work as, as expected. And even more so if they have no, say, actual way to deal with de-anonymizing application layer attacks, then things really start to get bad. And of course, if the FBI anonymity network was all outsourced to one company, for example, that's really bad news when that one company is totally compromised and say the FBI agents connect directly to that anonymity network from say FBI headquarters where they work to the anonymity network. Well, that means that someone to, to compromise that anonymity network, they only need to get a job at that company. That's not very strong anonymity. And so with Tor, what we're trying to do is basically the opposite of that, which is to provide some strong anonymity without these single points of failure, where everybody in the world, not one human excluded, has access for free and where anybody can be a node, not one human excluded, in the uh, immortal words of Bill Hicks paraphrase there. Um, for those of you that don't know Bill Hicks, I highly recommend a visit to YouTube. Um, very funny, possibly the funniest American to ever live. <coughs> and I don't just mean the way that he looks. So we have 40,000 people, 50,000 people in Iran using Tor directly every day. Those are not just subversive revolutionaries. Right? As censorship becomes more pervasive, hopping over the censorship, needing to anonymize yourself, needing to be free of traffic analysis, why that becomes a normalized thing. It's not subversive to use this network anymore. The number, the number two people in the world using Tor these days are people in Iran. It, America, still number one in something. And number two, Iran. Number three, Germany. Just, I mean, to think about that for a second, Germans really care about their privacy. And on a per capita basis, America having the number one set of users, it's not too impressive since we have 330 million people. You know, 60 or 70,000 people using Tor every day, eh, whatever. But when you have, say, 10% of the American population and almost the same number of people, that's pretty big. That's actually quite, quite something. And so really, uh, Iran might be the number one set of users, depending on how you look at it. And that is, I think, really important. Um, it's really important because it means we are starting to solve the diversity problem. Now, there's a funny problem from that, which is, who's visiting your website? Well, it might be an Iranian by numbers, right? So we need more people to use it, obviously. But realistically speaking, we're really working on both of these. And the way that we do that is with free software, open specifications, peer-reviewed design. And we make it freely available for everyone. We build it for people. We make it so that there's incentives for people to use it. Um, we think that that promotes safety in a good way. And we think it's a lot better than using, say, a virtual private network or not using anything at all, right? When you surf the web unprotected, that's not a good idea. Like other things, you should use protection. Uh, so here's a basic directory design. First person that raises their hand gets a club mate. What's wrong with this directory design from a censorship perspective? We've got the trusted directory authorities, of which right now there are eight. Servers, such as Tor Relays, publish their descriptors, that's their IP address, their public key information, and so on, to the trusted directory authorities. The directory authorities get together, and they make a consensus. That is to say that they, they say, I believe these are the relays that work. I've tested these relays. I think that they are successfully relaying Tor traffic. And they push that out to all of the other relays in the network as a cache, so that any Tor client can talk to any relay any cache, any directory authority, and learn about the whole network. The big problem with that is that Alice has to download that list. So what's the other big problem? What happened, What can Mallory do with that list? Anybody? <coughs> Come on. Let's make this interactive. Didn't travel thousands of miles so that people would sit in the darkness. <laughs> I mean, I did, but don't make it that way. It breaks my heart. <laughs> are so much smarter than I am. Come on, one person, what's wrong with this? This design 
right? Allow someone to block access by just downloading the list. I give it away, I guess. But here's the solution. Instead of talking directly to the network, you talk through a friend. So you have a friend-to-friend -friend networking system. This is the bridge design. This has a similar problem, as we know, the enumeration problem. And of course, it has all the protocol finger fingerprinting problems. But the basic design <coughs> is extremely prone to censorship for entering the network, though it has very good properties from a, a private information retrieval perspective in terms of you have a giant list of things, you want to select k of n of those things, you want to make sure that the k of n you select has not been tampered with by Mallory, right? And that's how the directory authorities come in, unless Mallory can compromise each of them. Each of those directory authorities is actually located in different jurisdictions legally, and different countries run by completely different groups. So the Tor project, which is a nonprofit that, that operates the software development, does not, as a company, operate the directory authorities of the relay. Because we don't want to be vulnerable to a legal attack where someone tries to tell us to do something. But we don't run the network. We just write software. And that changes things quite a lot, because it means that what Mallory needs to do is come up with attacks on the network that are not necessarily based on social things. And because it's free software, we know that if someone were to kill us all in our sleep, you guys could pick it up and take, take it over and help out the rest of the world in our absence. <clears throat> and as they say, remember, whatever happens, even if there's a videotape, it was murder. <laughs> So, you can get a bridge by sending an email, you can get a bridge by visiting a website, and uh, a couple of people often pass these out via Twitter direct message or via IRC. Right? Obviously, some of these methods are much quicker and easier to automate. I wrote some uh, robots, uh, like uh, email robots, that they, they, they parse the emails that come in, and then based on what has entered, you get into a different part of the hash ring, you maybe um, get, um, a set of bridges, as I mentioned before, but you can also bootstrap entirely. Right? Since Tor is an overlay network, we wanted to leverage other overlay networks to get to the overlay network. So you send an email and you say, I want the source code, and we will email you the source code with the GPG signature. Right? Now all you have to do is find the right public key <coughs> to know if you've got the right source. We'll also send you a web browser that's pre-configured. So you just need to be able to reach any place where you can download email, and we will send it through there. <coughs> so now blocking access to our software and to our bridges becomes the hard problem of spam filtering, basically. We're, right? We're trying to really like stand on top of the shoulders of giants that came before us and uh, make it really difficult for people to get at this. Um, it used to be the case that, for example, people in the US government, when they would need to use Tor, including, I think, some of the funders of the Tor project, they have really heavy censorship on some of their networks. And so people could, of course, log into their Gmail account. So if they wanted to start Tor, what they would do is they'd go to Gmail, send an email to gettor at torproject.org, download a copy of Tor, email get a bridge, they'd add the bridge, and then they would start their Tor browser inside, and they would have bootstrapped entirely through a totally fascist firewall, and they would bypass it. And even if they had signatures for the Tor relays in the consensus, they'd get past it. Now, if they have, of course, protocol distinguishers where they don't block, they just alert, then you obviously don't get past that. But generally speaking, that isn't happening. It happens in a few places. But um, using these methods, you can actually bootstrap the Tor network using just a Gmail account or any email account with SSL. And now it's Google that hands out Tor, which is, you know, there's a lot of collateral damage in blocking Google. And if you try to do a man-in-the-middle attack on the Chrome web browser, when you go to Gmail, it will fail. Even if someone has a real valid certificate authority, like a TrustWave certificate authority, for example. So I mentioned this uh, blocking, of course, the directory authority and blocking the IP addresses in the directory and other, other Tor services, like if you block bridges.torproject.org, or if you find a way to filter that email, it'd be hard. And of course, I mentioned the fingerprint. One of the scary things, I think, of course, is that Number four, which I've mentioned extensively, could actually be like 4A and 4B. And 4B is that in the future we expect that some jerk is going to download Tor and do backdoor builds. Right? So you think that you got it, but you didn't actually get it. So this, this problem set just gets larger and larger as the adversaries get more and more angry. It's a pretty serious problem set of problems. We have solutions for some of them, we don't have solutions for all of them. And if, for example, you work on traffic analysis, we're really looking for a lot of things that fall into category three, right? If you know of a protocol distinguisher for Tor, please, for the love of God, tell us, because maybe it will save someone's life, quite literally. 
even though we don't necessarily know for sure that we can fix it, we definitely want to make it so that it's really hard for someone to classify this traffic. And we think, we think we're doing a good job of that, but the only way we know is when people, especially in the research community, say, no, you did a bad job of that. Here's how you can do a better job. Um, and we're also looking at steganographic transports, especially during really, really bad censorship events. And by bad, I mean they unplug most of the internet except things that are HTTP 1.0 spec only. What we need in HTTP 1.0 steganographic transport, where you have something that is the equivalent of a bridge, only it only speaks HTTP 1.0, and you make connections to it, and it transports Tor. Those are really difficult problems, because it turns out that steganography is really difficult to do right. And it turns out that if you think you're doing it right, you're probably still doing it wrong. So if you can help with that, or if you know people that can, this is really an open area of research. And sometimes we even have funding for this kind of research. So it's not enough to quit your day job, but it's enough to, I don't know, maybe you want to get another one, I don't know. So here's what the censorship actually looks like. If we look in the upper left-hand corner and the upper right-hand corner, um, you can see there's some like kind of funny stuff there, like, bomb, site is not trusted. Don't go there. And I think that's like a coffee machine in the other guy's hand. On the left-hand side on the bottom, we see that that's the kingdom of Bahrain. In the middle, that's the Sultanate of Amman. This is actually a web form, which you guys will probably really, I don't know, you're kind of a tough crowd, so maybe you won't laugh at this. But um, this, this here is... Um, <clears throat> It's a form where you can fill it out and say, I'm sorry, there's been some mistake. You guys are total fascists. And I agree with that, except for the part about building this single website. Could you unblock it? <laughs> anyway, it's worth the shot. I sent them, you know, I submitted the form. Um, I have a friend in the Sultan of Oman who, I use that term in the very American sense, like Facebook friend. Um, you know, he was willing to submit this, so he put my email address in, in the website, and then put in a comment saying like, Hey, this is a this site is uh, blocked, and that's an accident. And they sent an email, which was very funny to me. And the email was base sixty four encoded, so that meant that they could put torproject.org into the body of the email. And the censorship system would not do a bidirectional TCP reset when it saw the string torproject.org. So what does that tell you? It tells you that even the people that run the censorship systems are behind it. And it also tells you that you can defeat their billion dollar censorship system with Base64. <laughs> anyway, they sent me an email later saying, no, we are not going to unblock that. No, it was not an accident. <laughs> no, or is it a mistake? Um, and then in the back we see, um, this is Saudi Arabia. Here we see some more. This is, um, this is an example, actually, of the social aspects that are standing behind. So on the left bottom side, we have Kuwait. Above that, we have another Saudi Arabia. Above this, we have the United Arab Emirates. And right here, this gem of a censorship page is in Qatar. So this is, I think, one of the most fantastically offensive, hands down, just downright dirty censorship pages you'll ever see. And the reason that it's so bad is because they pretend that it is not malicious activity when they censor your right to read or your ability to speak freely. They say, gosh, that's a mistake, huh? Gosh, whoops, right? What they're trying to do is condition people into not understanding how the internet works, and then telling them, oh my gosh, who would have thought that that would be blocked? <laughs> and this guy in military fatigues, and you know, and he's like, hey, just so you know who's in control, this webpage has been blocked, maybe because uh, it's content <coughs> prohibited. And you're supposed to think about it in the social context of, I have made a mistake, because they are right. Well, the thing is, is they're wrong, right? They're definitively wrong. It is, it is a censorship event, and they try to contextualize it in a way that isn't scary, but that also sort of changes the way that people frame it. But what kind of content? Uh, that was torproject.org. So, so just to be clear, this isn't, I mean, I, I mean, I understand that lots of countries are particularly religious, even more so than America, which is hard to imagine. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, fine. If you, live in a, if you live in a country where people have imposed this kind of censorship on themselves, I think it's a violation of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. I think it's wrong. I think maybe there are people there who should be able to choose otherwise. If you want to censor yourself, you can do it at your end workstation. Um, and I would even understand maybe if it was just pornography. But this is not pornography. 
I mean, I know that's a matter of artistic creativity and the taste and so on, but this is about an anonymity research network, right? This is, I mean, it's very clear what they're saying. What they're saying is, we have the right to spy on you without reservation. And if you try to use any technology whatsoever to get around that, well, we'll block that technology too. Your math literacy is illegal here. Your ability to hide things is something we want to make a crime. Now, of course, you don't get arrested for this, but I have heard that when you have too many of these, you might get a visit or you might get special treatment, depending on which country you're in. I mean, it's pretty serious, right? Like in places like Syria, what they do when they find out you're doing something on the internet they don't like, they send a death squad to your house and they kill you. There's a guy in, who recently posted on Facebook, uh, as a slight tangent here, when I was in Tunisia meeting with the internet authority there, we met some people from the Arab Bloggers Conference, and they told us that people in Syria posting on Facebook just totally trivial stuff, like, I don't like the Assad regime. That a guy posted that on his Facebook, not a political activist, just basically complaining, like in the most bourgeoisie way possible. Just like, blah, I don't care for this at all. And I was told that the, like an Assad government agency sent a death squad to assassin and shot him to death for posting that on Facebook. To sort of send a message. So that's what happens with this traffic analysis, right? An HTTP popular website almost serves as a honeypot. And then states terrorized through traffic analysis. Which is, I mean, I never would have imagined 10 years ago or 15 years ago that I would even be thinking about it in those terms. But some of the stuff happening in Syria and what's happening in Iran right now makes the Stasi look like cuddly bunnies. So just to give an idea about the contextualization of this stuff, some sites, they like let you fill in these forms. Sometimes they don't. The worst events, though, are ones where they started to do the blocking and then they adapted. And they realized that if they blocked access to sites, they would lose access to the actionable intelligence gathering services that they had on their networks. And so instead of blocking access to sites, in some cases, they block access to ways to securely reach sites. So blocking access to the Tor project. Or they block secure cryptographic handshakes, or if you try to do a Diffie Helmet with a particular prime number, for example. But they don't necessarily block access to the sites where you might say something that's valuable for them to learn. That's particularly insidious because most people don't realize that censorship is a second order effect of surveillance. So what that means for you know, anybody that didn't grab that because it's a little bit obscure the way that I framed it, is that if you imagine it as a tree, the tree from which all of this comes is surveillance. Censorship is just an effect that falls out of that surveillance. Like if you watch where people route traffic, you can add null routes. If you, for example, have an SSL man in the middle attack, and you have a certificate authority that can generate arbitrary certificates, well, you might look for a particular string and route those people in real time to analysts. Right? So these protocol distinguishers, which for HTTP, really easy to write those, right? For social stuff, it's keyword filtering. Those things serve as brutally efficient methods of oppressing a population especially if you should be so inclined. So here's what happened in not as brutal of a country as Syria, but um, on the 60th anniversary of some guy coming to power in China, I think his name was Mao, um, we went from 10,000 Chinese users to almost zero. And isn't that graph fascinating, how there's a little hiccup? That's not an error in our data collection. That is, in fact, an error in their censorship system. Right? So we went from 10,000 users, maybe we saw a little bit of a beta test around September 20th when we saw that little dip, right, where they tested it. And then September 25th or so, down, and then around October 1st, again. There were a lot of, a lot of things taking place there. That was where they pulled in the list and blocked. Here's what happened the next day. I went to China um, before this had occurred. We knew it was going to happen. I went to China and I taught people about how to use bridges. And since they didn't have stateful machines for doing packet inspection, and they only were doing it by IP and port number, well, check that out. We went from 10,000 people on my server to about 30, 40, 50,000 people the very same day. Because we taught them, you don't have to download a new piece of software, you just need to give it an IP address for a bridge and a port number, and then you're good to go. So we had almost nobody using it, and then when they needed it, <coughs> they got it. Right? So people who previously 
Can you imagine trying to, 10 years ago, tell someone, all right, you're going to have this anonymity network, and you're going to use it to reach things called websites and to communicate with people. And someday, there's going to be a government that's going to block access to your anonymity network. And uh, on that day, you will need to take an IP address and a port number and plug that into your anonymity client, and uh, then it'll work again. And so you need to have friends outside and inside. You need to run computers yourselves or something. And you need to solve the bootstrapping problem by solving the discovery problem socially. Look at that. Holy shit, that's crazy, right? I would never have imagined that happen. And it happened, and it worked. Um, sadly, it didn't work for very long. Here's an example. Was that a great spike? Right, we got over 60. We were like, you know, moving on up to 70. Well, um, the problem here is that China has a lot of people, so enumerating the bridge buckets is very easy. You can probably guess, for example, here and here, that this is a social enumeration of bridges. So this peak here was probably the peak where everybody was able to get this bridge and nobody was blocking those bridges. A couple months later, we see that it drops off almost to zero. And what we see when it drops off to zero is probably that the bridge enumeration process was automated. They, they automated it in a way where we couldn't tell the difference between people enumerating the bridge buckets and people who were real users. And so every IP everyone would get it's almost as good as a prot protocol distinguisher, right? It turns out if you want to solve a problem that has to do with China, don't try to beat them in manpower. Good rule of thumb. <laughs> right? I mean, I, I, I want to make sure that it's clear. We don't consider this as sort of taking on China. Like, the, the whole cyber war masturbation that you hear from a lot of people, just forget about it. It's total nonsense. And anybody that says cyber war, you can pretty much just know that they don't know what they're talking about. And the few people that do are only doing it because they want to be in the room. So this right here, this is not, this isn't cyber war. This is just people who are willing to spend the time to download these descriptors. And you'll also note at the very end, a very curious thing happens, which is that maybe their automated scripts broke. Something changed. This bump here. And we think what changed is that they are switching to a different method. An automated, an automated stateful classification engine for censorship, where they are actually taking the connections that are going through and saying, is this a candidate? Yes. Shunt it off to another ASIC, shunt it off to another router, and take some time to do something with it. Right? And in some cases, it seems like maybe they don't sync up their lists properly. And it's important, when people talk about China, they like to think about it as the Great Wall, right? So you've got this wall, and you, know, you can't get out. It's actually like a spider web, like this. So you've got people here that have edge filters, we'll call them the Chinese government and the transit providers, and then you've got ISPs that have, they buy like commercial solutions or something. My understanding is that it, the situation for censorship goes something like this. The people at the ISPs get a phone call from the government, the government says, don't embarrass us. Whatever that means, nobody knows, so they're very overzealous in blocking, right? And it is certainly the case that the edge routers are much better there's some really funny problems with this method. So for example, if they do not actually validate what they are doing, but what if we handed them the IP address and port number of every website where Chinese people have to get visas? What would happen then? Automating this kind of censorship can have really serious unintended economic ramifications. So I'm sure half of you have caught that now, right? That's a pretty serious problem. So automation of this, I think, is, uh, is a fascinating Thing. If they automate certain kinds of censorship events, they may accidentally block wide swaths of the internet that are actually important. And until China has really replaced every single, uh, every single thing that people might need outside of the country, these kinds of blocking events are, are pretty serious. They can make a big impact. Um, and the active probing step, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, they, it looks like they forked our client, our Tor client. And so they classify it, they determine if it's a Tor client, and if it's a Tor client, they launch our software to try to do a handshake, and if it does do a handshake, then they classify that connection as Tor and then tear it down. Anybody want to make a suggestion about what we could do with that? That's a pretty fascinating thing, right? So one of the things is that they use an older Tor client, and we've had bugs in it. What's wrong with this picture? Well, they didn't send us any bug reports, so unless they fixed them secretly, 
and they're not running the new one where we knew where we fixed the bugs. <coughs> That's pretty hilarious on a number of levels. So for example, maybe we can get them to burn a lot of CPU time and get their filters to melt down. <laughs> Just about, right? I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stuff you can do. I mean, especially when you control the literal software running on their filters and their probing devices. Crazy stuff, right? So that's a really awesome question. The question was, can you basically tar pit legitimate <laughs> users in such a way that legitimate users would be able to bootstrap or connect through and would take a really, really long time to confirm? So attackers probing wouldn't be able to do much with that? Um, I think that's a really good question which deserves a design paper, maybe. Uh, I'd love to talk with you afterwards because that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to think about. Um, one interesting problem is that, for example, in Burma, um, the government actually bought blue code devices that do full SSL man in the middle attacks for everything. Sometimes it's turned on, sometimes it's not. So in that case, they just go scorched earth. That's really hard to deal with because if you have a whitelisted internet, as is sometimes colloquially called, what do you do about that? Well, you have to get sites that are running these okay whitelisted services to run a bridge. That's a way harder problem than just running a bridge anywhere on the internet. So, I'm gonna jump back in time here. I love this story, and I hope that it interests everyone. Square root of two, it's an irrational number. It used to be political to say that the square root of two was an irrational number, and as a result, there was a man who was drowned for saying this to the Pythagorean cult, who did not believe that there were such a thing as irrational numbers. And so they killed him. The reason I mention this story is because history is repeating. You see, in Iran, in 2011, they took the P that we used from a Dickie Hellman handshake, and they banned it. So if you were to pass in a TCP connection, specifically in a Dickie Hellman, but probably in any TCP connection, this magical number, which, by the way, is specified in an RFC. We are apparently the only people that read the RFC and decided to use that safe prime. <laughs> oh, the pains of standards, right? So that, that prime, which if you look online for a prime number, which is safe to use, um, that safe prime is verboten in Iran. And if you use that, your connection will be torn down. Crazy, right? Right, so people are trying to use mathematics to communicate how the world really works. And just like in Greece, they're being punished for it. Right? Obviously, it's not happening in Greece anymore, it's happening here in Iran. Because people are asserting their control about their worldview. And their worldview involves being able to spy on everyone. And using math allows people to resist that spying. And so they banned this prime number. So what do we do? Well, we thought about using a different prime number, so we did. We now use a prime number from a very popular web server, which is much harder to block on that. If you use that as your distinguisher, then you block every SSL connection for the Apache web server, really, actually, this time. And I wrote some code that dynamically generates a safe prime, so if you want to, you use a different prime every single time you start up. So there's some guy there that's searching for every prime in handshakes, adding them slowly. <laughs> maybe doesn't know, or maybe she doesn't know, I don't know, but adding them won't matter. Probably you're not going to pick the same prime twice, I hope. If you do, well, we've got bigger problems, I guess. Um, so it's a server-side parameter. So what that means is that it was really easy to fix it. We had a block, and I think less than 24 hours later, we sent out a patch, and after that, everybody was back. So we had a drop that looked like that. Right? Those red events, um, are any of you guys familiar with the incredibly brilliant researcher George Denisis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of you are? Okay. He wrote the code here that uh, basically says, hey, <laughs> that looks like a censorship event. And so those red marks are where we have some classification and censorship occurring. And that, that bottom out is, of course, where this occurred. So um, in this case, this is exactly the event. This is where they filtered the prime number. As I if I recall correctly, that's what this is. So we went from 12,000 users, close to zero. Interesting question here also is about anonymity networks again. 
if you have a filtered internet connection, you're clearly part of this chunk of users that is now blocked. What special part of society do you have to be in to be in this chunk of people that is not censored? Right? Do you, do you see where I'm going with this? So now we know that people who filter the internet maybe don't filter themselves. I don't know for sure, but that is quite an interesting thing. Because you look at these graphs and you think about it in terms of the relationship to privilege. And the privilege they have is the privilege to not be censored. So does that mean that the people that censor the internet in this country use Tor too? <laughs> I don't know. But it gives you some idea about the way that society divides itself. And I'm going to talk a bit about Egypt here, and it's quite, quite interesting. Um, Egypt was doing quite a lot of filtering, of course. I'll just quickly skip to this graph. We didn't have a ton of users in Egypt. We still don't have a ton of users. By comparison to Iran, Egypt is like not even on this graph, um, or is not even on the on the on the measure there, right? We're talking tens of thousands of people, mm -hmm. just a few thousand people. Okay, well, a couple things happen. One thing is that people think of this event as if someone has pulled the plug. That's not actually what happened. What happened is a bunch of core routers derouted their BGP announcements, right? Well, a funny thing happened, which is the Internet two connections stayed up for the Ministry of Communication. They're spooky spook spooks. <laughs> and I could reach it from my university over Internet 2. But for the rest of the internet, Egypt was disconnected. So the Library of Alexandria, which had a leased line, some banks that had leased lines, they stayed up. And the Ministry of Communication via Internet 2 was still online. So it wasn't just that someone went and cut the cables. It was that they derouted them. And they didn't even deroute all of it. This is just what the global internet looked like for some people. So again, it's a matter of privilege. In Egypt, we saw that spooks, being spooks, wanted to maintain the ability to communicate and, of course, to maybe even continue spying. So they kept some networks up. But the majority of these Tor users were not able to. We really did have a flat line there. I mean, when they pulled the plug, it really changed things, right? I mean, that's sort of, now you know, when you see that, that's like the last gasp of a totalitarian regime. Right? They pulled the plug, and then their uh, people overthrew them. I can't imagine that people 20 years ago would have thought that that would happen. <laughs> Someday there's going to be this thing, it's called the internet, and they're going to take it away from you, and then that's going to be it. Your government is going to fall. Surely this will be the thing. So, Libya, what do we notice? We see the same thing. Now, obviously, the numbers here are, are not as high, right? So going from 270 or 280 or 300 users to zero, Something happened there, but what is not clear. Obviously, the internet basically unplugged itself to some degree. They did, however, get leased lines and satellite phones and so on. But there's a thing that's happening here, which is that this statistic is generated by looking at GIP data. And when a country radically reorganizes its uplinks to route through Europe, for example, well, we see spikes in other countries where we see drop-offs in this country. But this gives you an idea about what we would call Libya on the internet, just going dark. And um, just, I think, as we saw with Tunisia, and just as we saw with Egypt, and just as I hope we will see with Syria, and with maybe even Iran, depending on how things go, um, that was pretty much it for Libya. It took a little while, but these events are definitely correlated. Um, Syria has some pretty crazy stuff going on here. Um, specifically, they're on US trade embargo lists. <laughs> And somehow they managed to acquire blue code devices, which I guess some of you guys are familiar with blue code. Um, the blue code devices actually filtered the SSL connection. And the SSL connection um, on any port was blocked. That's a pretty big problem. And basically, um, the ISP that did it, all the Tor users on that ISP dropped offline. And, um, then it came back and there were no more Tor filters. So they stopped blocking it. Maybe they didn't block Tor on purpose. Maybe they just blocked SSL. It's not totally clear what happened. What is clear, though, is the blue code devices saved their log files to an FTP server. And <coughs> people hacked the log server and released them all. So we actually got to see what these deep packet inspection devices looked like, what they were looking for, who they actually observed. And it was released to the internet by a group called Telecomics. Which, I mean, privacy concerns aside, they thought they could anonymize the data set by just removing the <coughs> IP addresses, which 
if you have a data set of everybody's internet browsing, your IP address is not the only indicator of who you are. So it's kind of a little bit sketchy that they did that, but it gives us an idea. For example, with Tor, you see that a TCP connection happens and that's it. With some other anonymity solutions like this piece of garbage called UltraSurf, it actually shows all these bootstrapping steps and all sorts of information and connects back to a bunch of things that are very fingerprintable. And so something in that particular uh, logging system, a bridge, is just a TCP connection in that log file. You don't learn anything else. Later you can't look at the logs and say, ah, I think this was something else. Um, with these other systems, there was a lot more. So that teaches us an important thing, which is when you have these logging systems, what kind of after the fact data retention will betray users? And bridges are very effective in that context because they're not listed in a directory and it just shows as a TCP connection. Um, so here's Syria. Um, basically, we went from zero in 2010 and now we're quickly approaching 10,000. So we're really seeing a lot of people start to understand that surveillance and censorship are a serious issue to them. And we're starting to see people take action to do something about it. So Iran, of course, always trying really hard to uh, target everything that does any kind of circumvention whatsoever, went apeshit on us and uh, grabbed our TLS certificate. And we know now for sure that they were targeting us. This was not, they're targeting SSL, they're targeting TLS. They took this certificate lifetime, so they looked at the um, ASM1 encoding of the certificate, or whatever DER encoding of the certificate, I guess, um, and they, they blocked that. So that gives you two really interesting things. One is that that means that when they do a stateful inspection and they classify your protocol as SSL, then they parse DER and ASM1, which, well, huh, all right, pretty interesting. Can you imagine how bad that is, that parser? That's fascinating, right? So imagine if you can get them to classify your packet and they're looking for a particular thing and they use, say, like a popular ASN1 parser, <coughs> or even better, they wrote their own, right? So that's pretty crazy because it means that they're really doing a lot of things that we barely know how to do securely in totally free software or open commercial products. And they're trying to do it at line speed to determine about blocking someone. They probably don't parse it, actually. <coughs> and they might not parse it, but they might parse it. In this case, what we did is we changed it to be a year, and that was pretty much that was pretty much it, and I was blocked. And in the case of, of this particular thing, these are rotating numbers, they're not fixed identifiers. So they at least semantically understood that identifier. They had to search through to find it. Right? If it was a fixed identifier, you don't have to understand anything about it at all. But in this case, they really did look at the certificates, and just by tweaking one part of that, it changed the blocking event, which is kind of crazy. We knew that this could happen because our certificate lifetime was two hours. But we also knew that if that was what they picked to block, we could ship a fix very easily. So we did, and I think that was a 16-hour fix. Like, we heard about it, we wrote a patch, we deployed the patch, the network upgraded, and 16 hours later, everybody was back online. So it looked like that. So, yeah, so in September, that red point, George is like really spot on with his predictive model of censorship, huh? It's really cool. So we see drop, and there we are. So we're talking about like 90,000 people in Iran using Tor. <coughs> Under 10,000 there in the beginning. So that means that the normalization of this is just huge. And this graph is also pretty useful. Um, it's not accurate. This is um, like a couple of months old. Um, but basically, I imagine that this number is actually here, and this number is probably about there. But it's pretty amazing. OK, so now basically, we've heard some things which we're not totally sure about, which is that um, Iran does this DPI, and it looks at the handshake. And uh, when it looks at the handshake, it says, oh, it's SSL. We're not going to block it, but let's give it 8 kilobytes a second in bandwidth. Right, so that's pretty <coughs> insidious as well. And in China, we see the active probing I mentioned. And this ticket here, 40, 4185, is amazing. Because it actually talks about all the IP addresses the Chinese probes come from, usually a different IP every time. And it's just from the pool of all the IP addresses that China has. 
just one of the IPs routed out of China sends a TCP connection. Because if they control the edge, they can take everything that's behind their routers and they can use those IP addresses and do man in the middle so they can impersonate every person in China that has an IP address and then do probes for them. And as of yesterday, a pretty crazy thing happened. And this is like totally new, actually, that this has occurred. And uh, I mentioned that we had a sort of bet, right? And the bet was that if you were to block all of SSL, then yeah, okay, you'd get to our two. And no one would do that, right? As of yesterday, Iran has actually done exactly that. So if you try to go to encrypted.google.com, you can't. The TLS is just straight up filtered. That is amazing, because it means that for all of the encrypted services that Google offers, that's it. You're done. You can't reach them. But it's for every TLS service on the internet for some ISPs. Not, not every ISP, so we're back to, the, of course, the discussion about privilege. But that's quite an incredible thing, because it means that just basically one day, they went dark. That's pretty close to unplugging the internet, right? Because a lot of things that people use are no longer usable, unless they go plain text, or unless they use a steganographic transport that uses the plain text looking protocol to transport encrypted bytes or unless they do something else. So one of the things that we're doing now is we have a thing called Ops Proxy, or Obfuscated Proxy. And it's a kind of super encryptor, and it's specifically designed so that when you connect to a Tor bridge, so we're taking it a step further. You've got a bridge, so you have a discovery problem, but now this bridge, when you talk to it, it's not just a normal SSL connection. Now it's this obfuscated SSL, or rather encryption, and then you tunnel your SSL traffic over that, so your normal Tor connect, and then you break up the packet sizes and you run it on any port you want. And we try to make it as difficult to classify it as possible. We even allow keys for, for shared secrets so that the general problem is harder to classify in some cases, but the key problem is even harder than the general problem. And this is free software. Unfortunately, we weren't exactly ready for this to happen. So we don't have, for example, uh, every possible client built. We don't have every possible platform covered. So it's still very painful to deal with it. And sort of wrapping up here, since I see some of you are antsy to go. Um, basically, this is what we're up against, which is companies in the so-called West, in the Occidental area of the world, they build censorship systems. And in capitalism, Every company expands until it can no longer expand. That's the business model. Become the hugest player on the block and just keep going. But what happens when you have sold to every company you can sell to? You've saturated every market. You've expanded new markets, right? So even in places where it is illegal for some of these corporations to sell their gear, they expand into those markets too. And when they do, it means that we are not competing with people trying to suppress a revolution that have no knowledge of traffic analysis. We are competing with Californian engineers who build rules and do traffic analysis and use IDAPRO and reverse engineer our software and are part of the academic community. And those people sell their solutions, just like they sell guns and bombs. And they sell that equipment to these other countries, even sometimes in the face of international law. And those systems are what we're up against. That's a losing battle for people in those countries. Just like it's a losing battle when they're fighting with sticks against like a Tomahawk cruise missile. It's not gonna go well. And the surveillance systems that are being sold there, those ones by these companies, Bluecode, SmartFilter, WebSense, Nokia, Cisco, right? These companies, like Cisco, actually had slides where they talked about using their gear to find unwanted um, minority religious groups in order to wipe them out. Does that sound familiar? Anybody here remember Deutsche Homburg, IBM, right? They, their tabulation machines? Their tabulation machines were how they were able to do things so efficiently with the Nazis. And I'm sorry to goblins along my talk here, but it's really important to note here, when you build a tabulation machine, it is neutral. It is a tabulation machine. When you install it in Auschwitz, and you fine tune it to make sure that it kills Jews at, say, a rate of X per hour, it is no longer neutral. When you provide support for the Syrian military to crush an uprising, or to the Chinese government to find a religious population, like the Falun Gong, for all of their faults, they're still human beings that have a right to live. 
When you do that, you go from being a neutral technology company to being an enemy of humanity, and you go from a neutral business to someone who's profiting by spreading crimes against humanity. And when that happens, you're my enemy. And uh, that's bad news for you. So <clears throat> we're working on fingerprinting these guys so that we can hand it over, for example, to governments that want to take these companies to task for doing human rights violations as a business model for giving support, right? It's not like selling a truck. When you send engineers into Syria and you help them to refine their surveillance systems, you are really working against these people that are there and probably doing so in some cases against international law, European law, right? If you wouldn't be allowed to sell them weapons, it's probably not the case that the surveillance systems are better. Um, and so to that end, a couple of days ago, I released this piece of software which we've been working on. It's called Unipro, um, as in the dreaded Uni. And um, <coughs> Uni stands for the Open Observatory of Network Interference. And the idea is that we want open and free software, or open source software. I prefer the term free as in freedom. Um, so everybody can have access to this source code. It's for open methodology so that we can start to quantitatively and qualitatively perform science on censorship and surveillance events. Right? The open net initiative, ironically, is not open in that they don't have open tools, they don't have open data, and they barely have open results. They're basically political scientists with really, really good intentions who wrote some pretty s simple tools and then they make broad comparisons about the whole world. Sometimes they're really right from a political perspective, but we need to like really up the science here. So everybody's talking about cyber warfare, and what we're hoping to do is start a dialogue about cyber peace building, saying that the right to observe is a fundamental right. In fact, it is the cornerstone of any science. The ability to observe the world is how we can learn what is actually happening. And from that, we can draw conclusions, we can do new things. So open software, open methodologies, and open data results, archived for people to write papers. We don't want to write papers. We want to get the data from people to understand the censorship events, and we want people to have the software so we can have uh, a set of tools which anybody can run so that we can understand what kind of tampering is happening, what kind of censorship is happening, and what kind of surveillance is taking place, which will hopefully allow us to help people make decisions about how they use the internet and how the policy is set at a national and international level based on facts not just arguments from emotion, but actually like, hey, these guys tamper with SSL, these guys don't do this, these guys do this, this happened at this link on this particular uh, MPLS tunnel, for example. And this software is available today. It's pretty rough around the edges, but it's a start. Um, we use it right now to measure bridge reachability. So we have machines around the world, and we have a list of bridges, and we actually fire it up, and then we collect the data, and we're looking at that right now to understand when a bridge is blocked. So we can have yet another way to detect censorship events in the country, but also for us and our network. Um, yeah. So a big part of this is, again, censorship and surveillance, <coughs> but specifically surveillance. And I really recommend that you check out bugplanet.info and spyfiles.org. And part of the reason is because you start to see the companies, and you start to see stuff like AIMSYS. AIMSYS is a French company that sold surveillance equipment to Gaddafi. And in doing so, they definitely violated some laws. But specifically, they sold equipment that was used by Gaddafi to spy on journalists in France and in the United Kingdom, as well as activists in, in of course, Libya. And in fact, the company sent brochure information which included journalists' names and email addresses. So they are aware of what they are doing. They are like Deutsche Homage. They understand that they are not selling a neutral technology. They understand that to the extreme. And there are hundreds of companies just like this, not necessarily as egregious. And their manuals about their devices, to give you an idea about what they're working on, some of their technical specifications, it's all on these websites. Thanks to some people who decided to find that information out. So, uh, that's pretty much all I've got to say uh, for this with regard to slides. And I've taken exactly the amount of time I think I was supposed to. So if you guys have any questions, I'll turn these lights on and then we can talk. Sorry if you're really depressed now. <laughs> <laughs> but the good news is that we can do something about it, right? That's the really positive message that I'm trying to tell you. So this time, we don't have to wait 50 years for Edwin Black to write a book about IBM and the Holocaust. 
Now we know. And in fact, we are building technology that's going into some of these deep packet inspection machines. We are living in countries that export these things to places where people have no hope of evading them. So I'm not sure that Ralph told you there was a major ethical component to my talk. Um, but there is, because it turns out anonymity is a social issue just as much as it is a technical issue. And there's some pretty serious social ramifications as well. So, Any questions? How do you know that, okay, it's pretty easy to, to spot the censorship event, right? Because the users go down. But how do you know what kind of censorship is happening and how do you know what kind of measures to take against that sort of blocking or filtering? Um, that's a really good question. Um, the short answer is, we don't always. So, in some cases, the Tor network isn't blocked at all. But if you request a website, and it has a particular string, it's blocked. And we hear that. We hear it from people that say, I needed to use Tor because when I use HTTP and I send the word Falun Gong, I get a visit from the police, for example. That's, that's one way. And another way is that sometimes we have access to computers inside of these countries, and then um, we can test ourselves. We witness this ourselves. And in some cases, at least for me, I like to travel. And I'm not willing to tell people to use the software unless I'd be willing to use it in their country, too. So I've been to most of the places I just mentioned. And I've used this there, and I've tested this censorship and the surveillance myself. I've been kicked out of a couple of countries, which is pretty horrible. I don't recommend it. Um, but I mean, I think that it would be um, pretty negative if we weren't willing to do these measurements ourselves. We don't want, you know, this isn't imperialism. I hope you all recognize that. This is that we're trying to build alternatives. And people choose to use those alternatives freely. We try to do that with the best information we can. We try to be transparent about the fact that none of it's perfect. So in these cases where we don't have perfect data, a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's hard to get data. There are linguistic divides. You know, I, my Arabic is horrible. Right? It's uh, a lot worse than my English and certain than my German. So, you know, users have to know to help to tell us these things. So the Open Net Initiative has done a really good job about this. They usually have contacts with people on the ground there. But the sad thing is that they don't necessarily have the right tools. So the data they get isn't as useful, right? They couldn't tell us there's a particular protocol distinguisher and this is what it is for these ISPs. So. There's some trade-offs there. We'd like to have more people in more countries, but we're also cognizant of the fact that we don't want people to be executed for being spies. Right? We want to push that we have the right to observe. But that's a hard thing to push. So when people are willing to come forward and help us with that, we're willing to work with them to the degree that we can. But there might be risk. Like in Syria right now or in Iran, I think it is a life-threatening thing to, to, to contact us. And I would not really encourage people to come forward to do that because it's a very scary time and in a pretty scary place for a lot of people. Earlier, before I came to this office, I actually talked to someone in Tehran, and he was saying that this weekend is going to be a big uprising, and so the government, in order to stop the uprising on the 13th and the 14th, that they are doing preemptive arrests and other things like this, right? And so this guy telling me that at a time of national emergency, I mean, what would the besieged militia do to him? This is, these are the people that shot that girl Netta in the heart for being near a protest. So it's pretty serious um, and quite scary. And that means that sometimes our intelligence, if you want to call it that, is not, is not spot on. Um, but in the case of Google being blocked, this is a really useful thing. They have a public traffic report. And when they have graphs that go like gigabits per second to zero, but only for SSL, and we hear that all of SSL is blocked, and when we hear that the core isn't working and our graphs start to go down too, without having talked to a single person, we can observe in a privacy protecting <coughs> way, ironically, uh, and we see that, in fact, there has been a censorship event. We don't know every detail, but we believe it's Huawei, the Chinese company. They uh, appear to have uh, exported quite a lot of equipment to Iran, and um, so you can thank them for these censorship events. Yeah? So you're mainly concerned about drops in usage, but, but aren't you concerned about spikes in usage? Spikes as in... A lot of you could, for example, have a blog net which uh, just imitates usage while in fact nobody is using it. Well, I'm not really worried about that. I mean, if you have a botnet, you have better things to do with your time. Yeah, but the government could rent a botnet so that the graph looks good for you, actually. 
Um, it's possible that that could happen. It seems like if they had a botnet, they would be better suited to just try to take the network out. Right? I mean, it could. Like, for example, if the government rented a botnet running in their own country, that would be kind of strange. Would it just like DOS all the authorities? Yeah, exactly. So that's an authority. Yeah, I mean, you're not giving away any secrets there, right? I mean, the problem with the centralized design is centralization. I mean, it's, it's a huge problem, right? If the directory authorities go offline, if we get denial of service, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, serious, it's a serious problem. And that costs like lots of million dollars. Yeah. For, weekend. for example. Yeah. So it's a pretty big deal. We're working on trying to make sure that our directory authorities are not just run by trusted people in diverse countries, diverse geographic mm -hmm. locations, but also on links that are like 100 gigabit, able to deal with distributed denial of service attacks. It's actually a really hard problem to get those links for free. <laughs> if you happen to know anybody that would like to donate a link like that to us, um, there are some people that run those eight directory authorities. They like they would like to talk. I'm one of them. Um, I actually run my directory authority out of my pocket. So if I got an 80 gigabit, gigabit per second denial of service attack, I'd be paying for <laughs> paying for it personally. So there's some trade-offs with this design, but we think most of the trade-offs are worth it because it allows us to make different trust decisions, for example. In a totally peer-to-peer -to -peer network without directory authorities, civil attacks are much worse. They can cause more problems. Like a total free road design has other issues. So we think this is good. Um, luckily, we're not the only game in town, which is to say people use VPNs, they use open proxies, there are other things like Yop or John Doe, there's stuff like ITP. Now, whether or not those things are good at what they offer or what they offer is useful enough, it's up in the air. But luckily, the sensors obviously take their time and pick all of these things as what they need to fight, and not just for. So hopefully, if they get a botnet, they'll try to take down the world's VPN systems first. But uh, no, who knows about that? Yep. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned maybe it looked like uh, changing the traffic that doesn't look like Tor anymore. Uh, aren't you afraid that? Uh, yeah, so it is definitely the case. The question is, are we afraid that sensors will start to block traffic they can't easily um, categorize into something? So for example, this is definitely not HTTP, therefore it's something we don't want, therefore we should block it. Um, fear is not the word I would use, it's just a matter of time. That's going to happen. It probably already happens for tagging traffic. But we don't know. Right? There's no way to close that feedback. Um, and yeah, that's a that's a big concern. And when that happens, we hope that we'll have a statement of graphic transport that has been peer reviewed by the academic community, and that we figured out a way to use it in a safe way. I think that's really hard to do. Really, really, really hard to do. Um, so if you are interested, I think we have research funds actually to do exactly that. Try to research statement of graphic transports for free speech and anonymity. So if you are you particular ask smart questions if you're looking for funding. I don't know if we have any, but I think that's actually an open research problem where maybe the National Science Foundation or other groups has put money into understanding it. So if you just want to work on research, you don't want to think about all the rest of this stuff, that's an area of research which needs a lot of help because steganographic transports are really hard to do and even harder to know that they work. So, yeah. Uh, how do you think about this scenario of having censorship on the last mile? Like, uh, like the end of the last note, start like uh, snooping traffic and say, well, I will, I will be a, a censorship, but I will be part of the Tor network as well. You mean, um, you mean like an exit node that would block access to say porn, for example? Or uh, I don't know, some not porn, but I, I don't want you to know how, like, human rights sites or yeah, or communications. I just so like just a snoop. like a civil attack. Yeah. Like, like the Chinese government spins up a thousand nodes, they're all exits, and if you try to go to any Falun Gong site, it doesn't work. Yeah. Lucky, lucky for us, our design takes that into account. So, in, to a certain degree, right? Nobody has good solutions to civil, right? Civil is a big problem. All, all of the civils, right? In the case of an adversary deciding to tamper with traffic, we have a flag in the network. I didn't talk about flags on the network, but each of the relays is assigned a series of flags. So for example, it is fast, it is stable, it is an exit node, right? These things, these are flags. These are decided by the descriptors published by the routers, but also by the directory authorities making certain very simple decisions. 
If, for example, you set an exit policy on your relay that said, I only allow exiting to 8.8.8 port 53, which maybe some people do, because they want to allow you to use Google DNS, and that's the extent of the abuse they would allow to come out of their computer should any abuse occur. Um, in that case, um, the client actually solves constraints. So when they build the first circuit, one of the flags you need to have is called a guard flag. And about 10 or 20% of the network has a guard flag. So you pick that, and that's your first hop, unless you use a bridge. And the second hop, basically everybody can satisfy the constraints for that, because first hop, second hop, third hop, third hop exits the network, right? So the first one knows where you're coming from. They maybe know who you are by your IP address. They know your TCP uh, stack, for example. Maybe they can fingerprint the time on your computer. We isolate and compartmentalize the first hop from the second hop. So the second hop knows about the first hop and the third. Now, of course, the third hop knows about this website if you want to visit, or 8.8.8 port 53. When you solve the constraint and decide to choose that exit, if you then blocked access to that, then you would choose a new exit node and exit through somewhere else. And we actively scan for the exit nodes to look for tampering. We have a thing called snakes on a tour, because we're trying to get all those snakes off the tour network. I mean, there are some expletives in there, but I'll just leave those out. And, um, Basically, we try to mark those exits as bad exits so clients don't have to have that, because that's a performance problem. Um, the real issue is that even in Europe, there's a big threat with ACTA, for example, right? Things like SOPA, HIPAA, these kinds of censorship laws, where instead of hopping from places that are the exception, and there's a little bit of censorship, or a lot of censorship in one country, we're starting to see that you hop between different kinds of censorship. There is no more free internet. In fact, there isn't even an internet anymore. There are lots of little broken internets. So it won't even happen on purpose, what you're saying. And we try to take into account, but if we destroy the internet in order to save it, Tor itself is not going to be able to fix that problem. There are bigger social, legal, and, well, political issues at hand. So we try our best to deal with that. But if there's no more free internet anywhere, it won't matter what we have done with Tor. More questions? Yeah. In one of uh, your slides, you had a very interesting question. Was uh, uh, who was testing what and for what purpose? So what uh, what could you think about that? I don't quite understand. Could you? Uh, on, on one of your slides, you had a, a question. Uh, who was testing what? Ah, like the, during the censorship. Yeah. Event. So what would be your your answer to that question? My my guess. Yeah. Um, well, I had to wager a guess. What I would say is that. People who do censorship, um, they do it as a job. And it's probably, they're not even as passionate about their job as I am about mine, for example. Which is good, maybe. Um, I've met people that build networks. For example, I met a guy who's a network engineer in Bahrain. And he told me he works next door to the censorship guys. Right? They like, have the same office. And his desk is in one room, and their desk is in the other. He builds the networks, and they break them, he says. So what do they do? They do the absolute bare minimum they need to to get by to do their job just like everybody else that does a job they don't love. And so when we see this censorship events where we are pretty sure someone starts to do a block, it's probably because those people are doing their job in a way where they try to understand what they're doing. So in the case of China, we saw that they classified, detected, sent probe. And for a long time, they didn't do anything else. So some people in Sweden noticed this. They would SSH into their machine, and then they would get a probe from China. And in fact, the probe would come from anywhere in China at the same time. And if the machine didn't answer in a way that was acceptable to the probe, then it would tear down both TCP connections. That's pretty crazy when you think about the amount of state required for that to happen, and the amount of um, just generally in the packet switch network, or the amount of view you have to have. It's pretty crazy. Um, they went from watching and probing. So they went from, they went from nothing to watching. And then they went from watching and blocking in a not connected way to watching and blocking it now in a probing sense. And then they went from that to um, watching, sending active probes, making sure that it meets the classification, and then tearing down the connection, and then doing that for everything that they see. And then they backed off a little bit in China. And now they're back to doing the probing teardowns again. So I think what they're doing is they're tuning to make sure that they only get what they want. And they're looking at their data sets. And they're making sure that they're not, for example, wiping out the sites of all of the visa places where you
you would like apply for a visa to leave the country to go to another country, not visa to credit card company. Okay? So there's a kind of fascinating thing, which is you can see they're tuning them. I mean, it's like someone tuning an engine. And the traffic patterns for the network allow us to see that tuning. But this is just, I'm just pulling that out of my hand. We don't know for sure. But we can see other things outside of the graph that tell us that we think that, that is a reasonable guess. Um, and in some countries, we actually, like I said, have access to computer systems. And we can test both sides. And that allows us to set, get packet captures, for example, on both sides. And that's really useful because we can tell um, one side definitely received a TCP reset, the other side did not. We know that if we make a TCP trace route, for example, that if the TCP trace route, um, okay, so this is actually kind of a cool trick, which I don't think I invented it, but I certainly use it all the time, and I didn't know that anyone else had done it before. So let's say you have uh, a real chalkboard. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, fancy ones that you don't have. Say what? No, sorry. What? what you, <coughs> you haven't built one. The new ones that you, you don't have, so smart. Oh, yeah, yeah. The university where I work has uh, different ones. Okay, so. This is a really simple example. So let's say the white is ICMP, and let's say that the green is TCP port 123, and the orange is TCP port 0, and the yellow is TCP port 80. Each of these lines represents a hop before the connection is opened by the server. When you do a multi protocol trace route to TCP port 0, 123, 80, and then an ICMP trace route. You can draw it as a graph, and you can say the edges and the vertices are, let's say, you know, the path, right? And when the path is significantly shorter, you have found the link around where censorship occurs. It could have been here, could have been here, could have been here, obviously, but probably it's about here. And you can also tell for what protocols they do the censorship. And then you can have a lot of fun, because now, without ever even talking, for example, to the server, since you know it's three hops away, you can set the TTL on your packets to be low, and then you can just flood the server, and it will never even reach this guy, no matter what protocol, no matter what port. So you can do all kinds of crazy port scans, and you can even make a TCP connection, and then set the TTL lower, and do an in-TCP connection trace route, right, where you set the TTL and then watch it. You can do this in a stateful or a stateless way, and then you start to figure out where the locations are, then you can start to look at latency, and then you can start to look at whether or not you're changing the latency by probing it in particular ways, like maybe getting it to use more CPU time or not. Crazy, right? Well, seems like a lot of fun. So, this is something we're implementing in Uniprobe as well. So you'll be able to find a man in the middle, and then burn it CPU time, right? So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're trying. I mean, in a sense, it's fuzzy, but more intelligently than just throwing random data. We're trying. We're trying to really. Um, we're trying to really actually understand the, the state of things. And usually here, like for example in Lebanon, they have like a squid proxy, and it's unpatched. So it's this old unpatched free software piece of garbage. Good software in general, but the old version really bad. Lots of buffer overflows or whatever. DNS spoofing is possible. You get that. For example, when that box does a DNS resolve, you, if you're the authoritative name server, you can see what they use for DNS. You can poison DNS for the whole country, right? Because they all go through a filter that does a resolution. It uses a name server. DNS isn't secure. You can free poison it. Like there's just hilarious misconfigurations. So from a national security perspective, these are just like like a joke. You put this on your on your country's network, and all of a sudden that's it. Someone just comes along and compromises this, right? Your whole national infrastructure, your whole communication systems boils down to whether or not squid is secure. Which I wouldn't make that choice if I were thinking about it. That's right. um, and then there's other hilarious things like this box, its CPU is so loaded, 
it has so many TCP connections open that your latency goes to like 10,000 milliseconds before you even get an ACK. So you send a SYN, you get a SYN ACK, it comes back from there, but it takes like sometimes seconds because the box is so overloaded because of the traffic. They introduced, I mean, as John Gilmore is famously quoted as saying in Time Magazine, right, he says, the internet treats censorship as damage and then wraps around it. So they are literally introducing things which when we look at them with these tools, they look like damage. And in their case, they try to make it so you can't wrap around it. Obviously you can if you buy an extensive satellite modem, you can if, you, if you're the ISP and you have like multiple uplinks or something. But you can at least figure out which link is responsible. So you can do a kind of traitor tracing. Right? This ISP definitely at this link has a problem. Kind of, kind of useful to do that. And so we're planning to do this. We're even planning to have bounties. So you come up with a, like a novel way of doing a particular kind of trace, or you come up with a novel way of doing a particular type of censorship detection, and then maybe we'll like kick some cash in for a free software implementation or something like that. And then everybody gets these tools for free, not one human excluded. And then we can all run them, and then we can all collect the data, and then we can all infer things from it. Will you be able to tell like? the market share for some of these censorship systems, for example, from these data sets, which will let us know which of these companies is willfully violating embargoes, for example. Totally happy to hand that over to uh, <coughs> places that enforce those sanctions, for example, put some executives in jail. So, any other questions? Yeah? Um, yeah, do you already have an idea? Just coming back to the Iran issue. Um, how good the, the uh, obfuscating proxy is working? How many people can come back to talk? Yeah, so, um, like I said, we weren't really ready. Mm -hmm. So there's an arms race. We spent a lot of time trying to not build snake oil crypto, which means that we spend probably too much time thinking about things. And we had not really even had any builds for people to use in public for this software ever, really. Mm -hmm. And so now we are promoting the software, saying use at your own risk. We, we believe it gets by. We know that it gets by their censorship attempts right now. Who knows whether it gets past their detection attempts? Totally separate, right? Classification and the blocking are not necessarily going to happen at the same time. Um, it does work. But now we have to solve the discovery problem all over again. So I handed out a dozen of them today, maybe. But I did that by Iranian users coming and talking to me over a uh, secure protocol or tool bounce where they called someone on the telephone, they got onto IRC, they asked me, I told it to them on IRC, they told the person on the phone, they put that into their client. You know, that's pretty crazy, right? But because we weren't really ready for it, we have a separate problem, which is that it's not integrated into our metrics system. So even if every Iranian user switches to obfuscated proxies, we are not going to get that metrics data right now. We were not prepared for everyone to start using this today. But we want people to have this option, we want to build this alternative. So we're doing that before we care, like before the metrics come in. But I imagine what it will look like is the graph of Iranian users, you know, which is sort of constant and then going up, and then it constantly increases. It's going to go like that on the graph, but everybody that can will still be using it. And we're going to have to start producing software and sending out software that uses the obfuscated proxy by default. So one thing we'll probably do, which is the only smart thing that UltraServe ever has done, which is look at the language that your computer is localized in, and uh, uh, look at the language that your computer is localized in, and if you're in Iran, probably, by GYP standards, you should be using the obfuscated proxy by default. So making slightly different um, protocol, like link level protocol decisions, based on your country, based on intelligence that we've gathered. Um, I'm, you know, I'm really reticent to use the word intelligence in that case, but by learning about what we think, but we don't want people to stand out in the anonymity network, so that's a really hard problem. Mm -hmm. And plus, the discovery problem is really hard. So we could try to make it so that every core relay that exists, for example, also supports the obfuscated protocol, and then everybody could do it. It's done just by stateful packet inspection and classification, but it's not clear. Mm -hmm. It's not clear how to solve that. So we think people are using it now. I mean, we know people are using it now. I have not helped 70,000 people to use it though. And so we're kind of back to square one on some of those things. But at least when they connect, they get the same network they were using before. Um, it's a really hard problem. Um, I've been working on a way to distribute bridge descriptors, um, which is kind of crazy. Um, 
Have you ever heard of this? Any of you guys have ever heard of like Inmarsat or Thoria? These are like satellite systems. So I have um, a satellite pager, which like, do you guys remember? Did you even have pagers in there? Yeah. <laughs> that was like mo the most annoying devices ever in a movie theater. <laughs> well, these things don't work inside anyway, so no problem with them in a the movie theater. Um, but they're satellite pagers, which they have a very special property, which is that they receive only. And that's really quite something. So it means that all you have to do is be near the spot beam to receive it. And if you're near it, you get a message. And it's about as long as an SMS. And it's possible to send messages via a web form to these pagers. So I've been working on a thing where, given a pager number, over Tor, I post a bridge descriptor that gets broadcast down to Earth. And if you have one of these pagers, you can receive a bridge descriptor through an out-of-band channel. And then I have a protocol which I'm working on, which is less of a protocol, but more of a like practical pen and paper cipher stuff. You would still want a computer program to do the decrypting, but something that's easy to write, it's easy to transmit that if someone receives it and they don't have the key, they can't decrypt it. And now you have an IP address and a port number. Combined with something like the obfuscated proxy or some other um, signographic transport like system, it would be possible to do the initial burst through something like satellite pagers, then distribute through social networks inside of a country. And then from there, if they can't classify the traffic, which is a big if, then maybe you can get online. That's a lot of effort. I didn't understand one step there. So I mean, the Iranian government gets the spot beam as well, right? So they get all the messages. Yeah, so you just have to solve the pesky key exchange problem. Right. Right? So everybody, you give them a unique key. OK, so at least you have to distribute the pagers or the key out of band somehow. Or you tell people that have pagers, hey, give me this key. Right? And then you give them a, like a unique one -time key. Pad. Like a one-time pad, only something usable. Yeah, like you're in a number station. Yeah, like a number station, in fact. Only instead of, well, I don't know what number stations were used for, so maybe they were using them for bridge descriptors of a different kind. <laughs> but, uh, are you guys all familiar with number stations? No? Oh, here, I'll come. You guys want to go. I'll stop being the dog and pony show, but I'll, I'll play something special for you. Um, it's weird that you mentioned number stations because someone actually gave me this USB stick filled with uh, number stations. Um, So there's just these like high frequency radio stations where people don't really know where they're located. And they just read numbers <laughs> and letters. And if you're anywhere in the world, you can hear them. Don't you have nothing? I am school out of the Yes, I Great, here's a really good one. Um, this one's great. This is like. Um, Tyrolean? Yeah. <laughs> it's a Tyrolean number station. Um, this is a, it's a Hungarian number station? Anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> I can't wear USB sticks in my pocket. <laughs> That's the idea. Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm trying to find a way to do something similar and workable that works for everybody, where people who want to distribute bridges, if they can at least do one cryptographic key exchange, they would have a way to get a bridge descriptor and new bridge descriptors issued to them on a regular basis. Of course, you have the same problem. That's basically the bucket problem, which is that if you only have 500 and you can perform a civil attack on clients, then you have a problem. 
right? There's no barrier for entry, right? The, the Iranian government just says, I'm every Iranian citizen, give me a bridge. And somewhere in there, there's a legitimate citizen, and there'll be overlap with the illegitimate civil. And now you've handed out the bridge descriptor twice, and now that IP address and port number is done for. And the solution to some of these things, Telex, or a decoy routing solution like Telex. Telex was invented by Alex Hunterman and his students at the University of Michigan. The basic idea is you deep packet and inspect for good. So you see a TLS connection with a server that's legitimate, that you're allowed to reach, that's on a whitelist. And without having them collaborate at all, just like this, so crazy. Um, you have, for example, a person here, you have a person here, and this is like your legitimate bank here, so you have like an SSL site, you have a client, and it's totally allowed to make that connection and everything's fine. Well, in the client random field of the TLS handshake, which is one of the very few random fields that you're allowed to have in almost any protocol, what you do, is you embed an, uh, an actual ECC uh, signature or an ECC message of some kind. I forget exactly how he does this trick, but the client random field is small enough that you can put an identifier which is supposed to be random, and if you don't have the key, it is basically as good as random, assuming that their math is right. Um, and what happens is that the deep packet inspection machine is here, at the border of the country. And it looks for candidate SSL connections, and it looks at the client random field, and when it finds the correct one, it allows you to make the full connection to the server, where you've done the full key setup. But as soon as you start sending data to the server, <coughs> it actually gets shunted off over here to a telex server, where with the key that you've embedded in the client <coughs> random, you then actually take that entire thing and you have a full connection here, and it scripts out your flow, and now from there, you connect wherever you want on the internet. But as far as this guy is concerned, watching here, you're just going to a bank. And as far as the bank is concerned, Telex tears this connection down. So the bank saw one handshake and then it went away. So how do you put yourself between the same server and the bank? Well, you surround the country with deep packet inspection machines. Or for example, what you do is you take your server, let's say your server is at this university here, and you guys have some uplinks, and all of your sites are hosted here, and everybody who wants to reach this, you sniff these links with your deep packet inspection for Telex, and you give keys to everybody at this university, and what you actually allow is any secure website here can be diverted as long as the Telex system is in use, and it gets diverted to your Telex station here, and your Telex station then can make connections out to the rest of the world. And so you don't have to surround the country, you just have to surround encrypted resources. So you don't have to surround all of China, but you surround every website with SSL. Now we get to a point where the traffic analysts will have to look at the number of bytes transferred, how long the thing has been open, how frequently normal people visit the site. Like all of a sudden it becomes way, way harder than slash tour slash, for example. And that's not just port and IP address. So combining this with bridges, combining this with traffic camouflaging and with tour, that is a way harder thing to block. And so decoy routing is really, in some ways, the future of a lot of these problems, I think. Um, maybe. Anyway, it's uh, totally possible that that's not going to work at all. Um, they have one deployed, so you can actually use it today. Um, and what has happened, at least for Alex's homepage and other things at the University of Michigan, is that the Chinese government has just blocked them. <laughs> Right? So you block the site, which you need to be able to reach. Well, so yeah, there are not going to be a lot of Chinese students that are applying to his particular graduate program, I bet. But I mean, that's the cost, right? And so what it does is it takes a nation state problem and provides a nation state solution. That's Alex's tagline. And when you combine the decoy routing with the anonymity network, you don't have to trust the decoy routing to read all your packets, because maybe you don't trust them. Right? You trust them to give you availability, but you don't trust them to give you privacy, security, integrity, authenticity, and so on. So we're gonna to have to compose some of these systems, but now you again have to get the key for Telex out to people. So like that satellite pager thing I mentioned could be useful for getting the key that you only need once for tagging your traffic. And that's a, that's a hard one. Alex Halderman did that with um, Ian Goldberg, the creator of OTR, the guy that broke a bunch of seven. He, he didn't break a one, did he? With David Wagner, is that what he and he did? Yeah, they did the first break. So these are smart guys with a long history and smart gals as well working on this, and they're really impressive 
Um, it's, hard, it's hard stuff, especially the deep packet inspection stuff, because you have to get the deep packet inspection devices nearby. And you introduce a pretty big network security vulnerability when you add DPI to your network also, especially if you can not just inspect, but then make connections through the telex station. Like what happens when there's a bug in your telex station? It's a pretty big problem, I bet. Especially if your bug is in the DPI side, and then you can maybe sniff all that traffic. So there are trade-offs to be made here. Um, yeah. Anyway, you guys look like you're tired of me talking. So are there any more questions at all? Or? Awesome. All right, thank you for your time.